Yeah, I thought this first session was going to be basically good fun and we would just sort of look at uh, all kinds of exciting things going on in the future and try and figure out whether uh, Agile was going to be important in them. But as I started putting the slides together, I came to realize that actually this is a really super important session and that um, what we're talking about here is not to be taken lightly at all. So um, I think we're going to have a good time. We'll, um, we'll give it a few more minutes for folk to come along. Uh, we had quite a few, um, we, go. we had quite a few folks um, uh, interested as of this morning. I think we've got uh, about 25 people who've signed up. So uh, we'll see how we go. But um, I think the recording for this one is gonna be the more important one. So let's see how we go. Um, so uh, if you don't want your face uh, uh, to be recorded, um, then by all means, um, uh, don't, um, don't make it visible. Uh, I would love it if you did make it visible and I'd love it if you would um, uh, also uh, feel free to interrupt, uh, have your, your um, audio on as long as it's not, uh, you don't have background noise. I, I really like people being engaged. Uh, this is not intended to be everybody sitting there and hearing the words of Chairman Pete. Um, so I think we'll give it maybe one more minute and then we'll we'll get rocking and rolling. Uh, so welcome everyone. We've got a few more people coming. We'll give it another minute. Um, so I want to give an idea about why I wanted to do this session because the, the stuff we've done over the last few weeks has been really good fun. We, 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 um, I was involved in um, the one of the 12 patrons of the festival so I was involved in some of that stuff and then uh, Dov Sal has done a whole bunch of sessions on Agile Dow and yesterday we had the vinegar tasters session with uh, Amarantho and Nick Argyle as well uh, so sort of agile mindset stuff. And then uh, the first week I, I did a session on the descaling manifesto. And if, um, if we get an idea about where we need to go in terms of values and principles, I'm going to make some allusions to that today, but not very much. I'm much more interested in uh, domains. If we think of uh, the agile 40 retrospective, the stuff that's going to be important there is stuff that isn't even on our radar today. So uh, I want to do a, a session where we can where we can look at um, from an agile forty uh, reflection point of view, what sorts of things would be on our radar then. Um, in the the. The first week I mentioned, I, I, I did some stuff on the descaling manifesto. All of these um, sessions are recorded and part of the festival. Hello. Hello. Lamus, Lamul Chan. Ah, if you've got a lot of um, background noise, do please mute. Otherwise, you're very welcome. Hmm. I might mute you over here. You've got things going on. There we go. Um, so anyway, uh, this, the, the, this, the second week, uh, or the third week, we had, we had to postpone because of a, a, a little domestic accident involving a garage door. Uh, we had a lovely session on the Camelot model. And um, uh, if you're not familiar, this is a, a descaling business agility method that's really around accelerating the flow of learning through organizations, even large organizations. And uh, we're going to be running a bunch of games based on the Camelot model in March as sort of a, a follow on to the festival. And we're, currently the patrons are discussing the idea that, well, maybe, maybe the festival doesn't end at the end of February. There's, uh, there's a history in Australia of some festivals that, well, turned into ongoing cultural movements. In particular, there was a thing called the Aquarius Festival in 1973 that spawned a whole bunch of intentional communities uh, in uh, two northern New South Wales shires, Tweed Shire and Byron Shire, and a movement called the Permaculture Movement. And all of these things are still going strong today. So in 1973, they asked the question, well, 
we just had 10 days of love and peace, all of that Woodstock stuff with the mud, we didn't do that, we did it properly. Why would we want to go home? So I, I think there's, the question is starting to become important, and I'll do it, admit all, uh, when it comes to the Agile 20 Festival, Agile 20 Reflect Festival. But if we start to think in terms of Agile 40 Reflect, and I'm going to actually start the actual session now, um, then our perspective changes because suddenly we have to think about things that um, have up until very recently been pure science fiction. And uh, well, they're not science fiction anymore. And where we're going in the next 20 years um, is going to make a lot of the change that we've had to respond to in a manifesto sense, look trivial. A lot of the stuff that we're going to deal with in the next 20 years um, will make not just the heads of the, the, um, the gray hairs among us spin, but Gen Z or Gen Z, whatever you call the, the, the current generation, the post millennials, they're going to have an awful lot of trouble keeping up with this stuff. So um, we need to be there to help them. And so the intent for this session is to look at, well, what do we really have on our plate? What kinds of change are we going to have to respond to in the next 20 years? And that leads to an idea I want to call the Agile Fermi paradox for reasons that will become obvious very quickly. Um, any questions? before we go on. Oh, I should say it would be nice to, to make someone a uh, co-host so they can let people in so I can just do that hand wavy thing. My intention is that we'll have about 45 minutes of, of uh, hand wavy stuff and then uh, open the floor and we can all, uh, uh, well, you can all tell me what an idiot I am, which is what I like as far as learning is concerned. It's my learning style is people tell me I'm an idiot and, and then I go, oh, I learned something. So don't feel shy about that. Uh, now I'm going to make Holdor a uh, co-host and, um, and he's going to do the, the, the revolving. I have a quick question about the title of the session. Sorry, say, say again, Brad. I have a quick question about the title of the session. Yes, by all means. Is that anything to do with the Muppets? Agile in space. Yes, absolutely. That was the idea. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Uh, uh, so those who are uh, too young to, to, to get that reference, uh, there, there was this show called The Muppet Show when we used to watch TV and, uh, and there was a, a, a little um, sitcom on there called Pigs in Space with that kind of... I just posted movie. a URL, so... <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, so 20 years ago, um, a little bit more than 20 years ago, about nine months before the Snowbird thingy, a uh, bunch of crazy guys got together in Sardinia. Uh, and uh, most of these crazy guys are manifesto signatories. Um, if, if I look at, uh, it's very hard to make out in this little picture, which was the only one I could find online. Um, but we've got, um, let's see, that one's Alistair Coburn. This one's Eric Gamma. Skip over those two for a moment. Uncle Bob Martin, Dave Thomas, uh, Ron Jeffries, Kent Beck, Don Wells. Other Dave Thomas, uh, Ralph Johnson, picture was taken by Martin Fowler. Uh, this was uh, basically a stand up in the Mediterranean at the end of the XP 2000 conference. Um, and for my money, uh, this is really where Agile was born. Um, uh, Dave Thomas, the, at the time, round of Dave Thomas, at the moment, I think they're having a race. Um, uh, Dave turned up with this little pamphlet from the Rational Unified Process people that said that, as of now, RUP does extreme programming. And Dave said, fellas, if we don't rebrand this stuff, we're going to lose our lunch. Well, of course, we lost our lunch in other ways uh, to a scrum and safe and no end of other frameworky things. But that was what we were worried about at the time. And as to who came up with the word agile, um, my recollection is it was Alistair, um, and um, he claims that that's rubbish, that it was Mike Beadle, and given that Mike's uh, had a very unfortunate demise, I'd, I'll go with that. Um, 
but um, but anyway, this was this was really where we went. Okay, we have to have something. What's it going to be called? And the word agile started to become a, a, a word that that um, uh, became popular. Uh, I liked the word evolutionary, but never mind that. So this was a much simpler time, and. Uh, you know, to me, it feels like not much has changed because I think about the last 20 years, it's like, oh, I remember that like it was yesterday because, oh, I forgot to say, um, the, the, this bloke here, uh, that's John Sarkler there who was working at a startup with me. That's me. Um, so um, so I, I remember that like it was yesterday. It was a, it was a really lovely little festival. I, I ran the world's first agile game there, the Extreme Hour. We had competing sessions, Kent Beck, uh, ran one team, Frank Westphal ran the other, and Frank won. And I freely admit that's because the referees cheated, since I was one of the referees. I, I know that. Uh, 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 Jutta uh, Ekberg, I think is the word, is the name, uh, was one of the others. Don Wells was one of the others. Anyway, um, enough history. We want to look forward. But I wanted to touch on this because these guys, these guys and gals, uh, we were all looking forward and we thought we, we really had this thing wired, uh, that we, 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 were, we were at the forefront, we were going to define the future. And uh, that idea of defining the future is very seductive. Well, I freely admit my crystal ball is not very consistent. Maybe I, I, I got some things right. I was at that conference. I'd been running the second XP program in the world. But I was also uh, what you might think of as a Y2K nut. I was convinced. Uh, I'd done a lot of work uh, with uh, manufacturing systems and firmware and SCADA and so on. I was convinced we were looking at something very, very unfortunate and nothing happened or very little happened. And maybe that's just because we did a lot of remediation work. But I guess what I'm really saying is, for goodness sake, don't take anything I'm about to say as gospel. My crystal ball is, uh, is dark and misty and where it has occasional glimmers of light, I hope those will be useful to you. But um, uh, a lot of what I'm about to talk about is either uh, nonsense uh, or a weirdly distorted view of the world from the point of view of the people who might be listening to this talk from the Agile 40 Reflect Festival. Uh, with a bit of luck, I'll be there and I'll be able to poke fun at my 20 year earlier self, which is what I'm basically doing here. Um, so I want to suggest to you that we are looking at a, a new political imperative. We're used to left wing, right wing politics. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is more about upwing and downwing which uh, since nobody's defined these things adequately, I'll, I'll say upwing is basically what we need to do to uh, inherit the, the stars and downwing is more about inheriting the dirt, which I think is that was a bad translation of inheriting the earth. I don't think the meek get to inherit the earth. I think that it's, that it's not rosy for the meek. So we need to be bold if we're gonna deal with some of the things that are coming down the pike. What's coming down the pike? Um, my ambition for this talk was to talk about all of these things and uh, some of them I ran out of time to put the slides together. So I'll do some hand waving for, for, for some of them, but I do have a fair number of them covered in slides. And uh, if you wanna talk about the rest uh, in more depth, I will be delighted. And some of you will, I expect, know more about this shit than I do which is great and uh, will, uh, so please do interrupt and go, oh, wait a second, what about this and what about that? And you forgot this. Um, yeah, I bet I did. One of the reasons that I love what we're doing at the Agile 20 Reflect Festival is we are um, reprising some of that early Agile spirit in forming a learning ecosystem where we can learn from each other, the, the, the principle being Mu Hin Shu rather than Shu Hari, no host, no guest. We're sharing learning, and we're trying to accelerate the flow of learning through the culture, and that's better than you get at most conferences. So in that spirit, uh, do please stick your two cents in and haul me up short where I come up short. So to start with, a subject near and dear to my craggy old heart. Um, I, I am um, 
we were about a year away from 60 years old. And uh, so I started taking a, a very active interest in this stuff. Four year lifespan, when you start to get to 60, that, that might be a reality. So, um, so I, I, I take that seriously and I would indeed like more life. Um, here are some really depressing curves. Uh, these are the, the incidences of all of these um, commonplace diseases of old age. And uh, the, the pink curves are uh, females, the male curves, so the blue curves are males. And as you can see, um, once you start getting past 60, things start to look a little bit dire and, and, and for your lifespan, well, it's not quite that dire, but nevertheless, you start getting on the wrong side of these curves and, um, and, and that's not good. So what can we do about all of that? I mean, it's actually, it's kind of weird that all of these curves hit their hump at just about the same age. That, that strongly suggests to a lot of people that there's one common cause for all of these diseases. And you can read them on the screen. I don't need to rattle off all of the, the depressing names and the depressing statistics. What could the common cause of these be? That, that, that's a really interesting question because up until quite recently, the theory of aging was wear and tear. That um, there was this thing called the Hayflick limit that your cells basically stop reproducing after they've, they've uh, duplicated 50 times and then everything breaks down and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, there have been some breakthroughs quite recently. And one of them is the idea that aging is actually programmed in, that it's not wear and tear, that there is a single uh, molecular reason uh, for this stuff and or biological reason for it. And it's something we can actually do something about. Um, and there've been some astonishing results in the last year or two that, that make this seem real. Uh, it's not science fiction anymore. So to, just to give the background in a, in a nutshell, and this is a terribly plotted nutshell, and I'm not a gerontologist or a biologist, so I'm basically describing things I've read and I'm not an awfully deep, and if you are, then I hope you'll uh, put your hand up and go, no, you're full of crap and they'll be fine. Um, okay, so this idea of programmed aging, the notion is uh, whether your cells are young or old, they have the same genes, those don't change but there's a lot of markers that um, affect cell function that are called epigenetic. Basically, they're little molecules, methyl groups and so on that get attached to parts of the genome that turn things on or off. And so the idea is that that's where the trouble is, that we, we get a, a lot of um, uh, genes that either are turned on that shouldn't be uh, or turned off that shouldn't be and that the system for doing these things screws up. Well, it turns out that there are some housekeeping genes in particular called sirtuins um, that get turned off, or at least they don't get turned on. And that's because there's this particular protein called NAD+, uh, which you can look up these things if you want to. And that's NAD plus thing, as we age, it goes way down. And that's what powers these housekeeping genes, uh, the sirtuins. So without the NAD, um, all of these diseases of aging occur. And the reason the NAD plus goes down is that there's an enzyme called CD38 that attacks it. And CD38 is generated by old cells that have reproduced too many times. Those old cells don't die. They just go senile, they go senescent. Uh, so after they've reproduced 50 times, the Hayflick limit, then some of them uh, get told by the body's immune system that's trying to prevent cancer, hey, stop reproducing, just sit there. But they don't just sit there, they produce CD38, and that leads to all of this um, cascade of unfortunate effects. So uh, about five to 10 years ago, people started going, well, why don't we just start taking substances that will boost our NAD levels? 
uh, uh, nicotinamide, so nicotinamide riboside was popular for a while, then it was discovered that doesn't work very well. Uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, uh, that's been uh, pushed quite recently, and you can, there's all kinds of stuff saying buy this stuff, whether it actually does you any good. Uh, uh, well, it does mice good, extends their lifespan and health span by about 25%, but um, that doesn't sound like very much, really. I mean, yeah, it's an extra decade or two. That sounds great from our perspective. If it works for us, we don't even know if it works for us because the science isn't there yet. And there are also things you can do that will activate sirtuins. There's some stuff you can do that doesn't involve taking anything. Uh, it, it turns out that um, alternate day fasting is incredibly effective for um, uh, increasing NAD levels and human growth hormone and activating sirtuins and so on. And those of you who may have noticed a difference in my appearance over the last year, well, that's because I've been doing that, uh, plus exercising in the fasted state. And I'm not gonna go on about that stuff, but suffice to say, um, oh, and eat your parsley. Um, and, uh, and eat your broccoli. And if you go and have a look at what Ringo Starr looks like at age 80, you'll get an idea about what's possible because that's, that's his diet. And he looks younger than I do. Uh, so he's born in 1940. Now, another uh, bunch of things are coming up. This thing's called Synolytics. The Mayo Clinic has been trialing these things. I said, this is not science fiction anymore. It's not. Uh, Mayo have been doing a study for the last two years and they just started a new study. The results of the first study in frail elderly humans are going to be published in March of this year. And basically they've been experimenting uh, with a, a bunch of things that kill senescent cells, these cells that make the CD38. Um, and in particular, there's a, a very well understood, well studied, cheap over-the-counter supplement called Fisetin. And that's the subject of the study that's going to be published in, in March. And I've got a vat of that stuff in my fridge, um, uh, waiting to, to hear how well that worked. But they, because they've started a second study at a higher dose, that suggests that this we can actually be optimistic about this stuff working. And again, this has produced wonderful results in mice. So it seems like there's no reason it wouldn't work well in humans, but we'll, we're about to find out next month. So then Yamanaka factors. Um, Yamanaka is a guy who won the Nobel Prize for discovering four substances that reset your craggy old cells, reset their epigenetics so they go back to being stem cells. And um, Yamanaka, Yamanaka factors have been used in a lot of different experiments over the last few years, but the trouble with them was they were causing cancer. Well, there's a guy named Sinclair who's been behind a bunch of these things, also a countryman of mine uh, at Harvard. And uh, he's just been involved in some experiments at the end of last year, they were published, where they, um, they used three out of the four Yamanaka factors. And they were able to achieve astonishing uh, age reversal in mice and rats um, without causing cancer. Uh, in particular, they were able to regenerate sight in blind rats using topical uh, uh, administration of these factors, uh, basically eye drops um, that restored vision in mice that uh, basically had the equivalent of glaucoma and all the other uh, eye diseases you get with aging. And these things, um, are supposed to be, I mean, we're regenerating neurons. That's what, that's what that's about. So the idea that we can find a way to regenerate neurons, but they also had results to do with heart and liver function and all, all kinds of things across the board. Uh, I'm not gonna provide links here because I'd be doing that all day, but you can just Google for this stuff and you'll find it. Um, so that's amazing. But then there's also results around, well, a kind of different intervention. What they there's a, a bunch of people who've been taking different approaches to this. Um, Harold Katcher is one. Uh, he's been working with a guy named Horvath who came up with the first way to gauge epigenetic age. And they've got some results that suggest they've been able to reverse epigenetic age by 
54% in rats. Now, they don't even have the science to say that epigenetic age reversal led to actual biological age reversal. They haven't even done that in rats to say, well, this actually caused that. So this is very early stuff, nevertheless. This stuff is being patented and rammed through to human studies as rapidly as possible, in particular by Harold Katcher because he's 75 years old. And he, he, there's, a, there's billions to be made here, but he would like to live to make them. So uh, this stuff is um, no longer science fiction, but uh, absolutely on the cutting edge. You might go, well, okay, great. That's, that's all exciting. What can we expect for Agile Reflect, Reflect 40? Well, all of that's great, but it's about interventions. Uh, if, assuming that one or more of these things really has the profound effects on age that most of us who've been following this are expecting, um, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable expectation now. Most of the science is there. So, um, and certainly given demonstrations like Ringo Starr, just doing things that involve changing the way that you eat and the frequency with which you eat, um, those simple interventions can have really dramatic effects. Well, um, if we can broaden the base of those effects and then start to look at the root causes, what's, what's failing in the way that we are programmed to age, then we can start getting at the genetics of aging. And at that point, well, uh, we can produce humans who don't need a whole bunch of uh, supplements or need to go through rigorous fasting protocols. To tell the truth, it's actually really, really easy to do alternate day fasting. If you want to know how, that's uh, not going to, something we're going to talk about today. Uh, but, but ping me and I'll, I'll send you some links if you like. Anyway, um, but we can expect that we could program humans to have effectively no aging for the foreseeable future, you might go, oh my God, we'll have rampant overpopulation. Look at the mess the world is in today. Everyone's poor. Well, actually, no, they're not. Uh, if you go and um, uh, look at, um, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? He did a bunch of really good TED Talks and then I have to apologize. It's very early in the morning here and I've been up all night with slide where trying to get this stuff ready. So uh, it'll come to me, it doesn't matter. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of really neat uh, studies that have looked at what's been going on over the last century. And what's been going on is that human uh, reproduction rates have been dropping rapidly and human wealth has been increasing exponentially. And we really are, for reasons that we're about to look at, uh, going to see a whole bunch of accelerators on the growth of human wealth to the point that we can talk about an age of abundance. So does that mean dire things for the natural world? Yeah, it does, but those dire things are already happening. Uh, what it means is that we'll be able to adapt to them. And when it comes to population growth, right now, the best estimates are that population growth, human population growth will end by about 2060 that we will never reach 10 billion humans on this planet, at least not in the next uh, century or two. And that by 2100, we'll be down to 8 billion, which is just a couple of hundred million more than we have around today. So uh, we're not looking at disasters out of this. What we're trying to do with this is value the expertise, the minds of the people we have with us today, because uh, they're difficult to replace. And quite apart from the personal tragedy of aging, anyone who's had, uh, well, if you've got enough gray hair, uh, as I do, then you, you've, you've seen what happens to parents and grandparents. Um, so apart from that personal tragedy, the lost learning, the, the reinvention of wheels that comes with new generations having to learn the lessons that their parents and grandparents learned the hard way, uh, we can't afford that anymore for reasons that will become blindingly obvious very shortly. So uh, what could go wrong, though? Well, the obvious problem here is there are some people that uh, we wouldn't want to live for a long time. Uh, 
anyone who's seen the movie Gandhi will remember that bit at the end where Gandhi, uh, after he's been assassinated, has this little uh, epilogue where he says, well, you know, just think of it. All those murderers and tyrants, they all eventually died. How wonderful. I'm paraphrasing because I can't give the exact quote when I'm sleepy. Nevertheless, um, a smart version of Donald Trump, someone that was smart enough to avail themselves of these therapies and then live for hundreds of years. That's difficult to think about. Let's move on. Any questions before we go on, I should say. Okay. Um, relevance to agile is something, uh, so far I've only been treating tangentially. Uh, I should say that um, the big take home here is that responding to change means more than a little team going, oh, our product owner changed their mind. It means more than business agility, which we define as the capability to respond to changing market conditions in which the state of agile survey for the last four or five years has reported uh, only is only an outcome for about 5% of agile transformations, very depressing statistic. But that uh, responding to change thing, that's something we're gonna have to start baking into our civilization. If we don't, a lot of this stuff is going to blindside us and we're going to have some very bad outcomes, outcomes that might answer the question of why the Fermi paradox. And I should also say for those who are not familiar with Fermi paradox, Enrico Fermi, the guy who invented the atomic reactor, uh, the first atomic pile was Enrico Fermi, and he worked on the Manhattan Project. Uh, he was famous for turning up at breakfast one day at the Manhattan Project and looking at Einstein and, and Bohr and uh, Feynman and all of the other scientists and stumping them with a single question. And his question was, where are they all? Why is this an important question? He was talking about alien civilizations. Those guys were very well aware that we live uh, on a third generation star. We live in a galaxy that is about well, more than a dozen, a baker's dozen uh, billion years old. There should be alien civilizations everywhere. The galaxy should be jam-packed with intelligent life by now. Where are they all? This is a scary question because it suggests that, well, maybe, maybe we're doing all of this for nothing. Maybe we're doomed. But I think there are also some good reasons to think that we're not. And we'll touch on some of those here, but that's kind of outside the scope of this. Point of the agile Fermi paradox is um, if we can't get agility to be something that is baked into the way our civilization runs, well, maybe we are doomed. Now, alga culture is a weird word. Firming is a weird word. Let's, um, oh, I should probably back up just a little bit. This is a view of industrial agriculture from space or from a, uh, an airplane. If you've ever flown over the US Midwest, you look down, you see things like this. The circles are because of drip feed irrigation. But basically you're seeing a whole bunch of pretty much monoculture crop fields. Uh, they look like this if you look a bit closer and you can see there's these big round things with the drip irrigation. The, the stuff that looks like a, an old punched card in the middle, uh, this is cattle feedlots. And the reason that they're there is that those monoculture crops, the ones we, we, we like to eat, uh, the wheat and corn and so on. Um, most of the parts of those plants uh, are things we can't digest. We don't, we don't have the right metabolism to be able to digest the stalks and stems and leaves and roots and so on. Um, but cattle do. So we, we feed that stuff to them. We take the fruits and berries and, and nuts and seeds and we eat those and we, we give the cattle the rest. And well, if we look a bit closer at these feedlots, we start to see something a little bit disturbing. As you can see here, there's this 
patch of algae that is eating the runoff from the, that comes from the cattle. And um, well, it's the only organism that can do because the, there's all of these nasty herbicides and pesticides that are sprayed on the, the crops. And then the cattle are all given lots of antibiotics. And um, so their, their uh, excretions really not good for fertilizer per se, but the algae can eat them. And that seems really depressing until you start to think, why don't we cut out the middleman? What if instead of planting fields full of uh, crops, what if we planted fields full of algae? Because algae is this wonderful organism. It's incredible. It just with dirty water and uh, light and, and air, algae can double its biomass in less than 24 hours. It grows far faster than any of the other crops. And there are already strains of algae that are edible by humans. If you go to your local health food sh shop and you, you buy a, a spirulina biscuit, you're eating algae. Doesn't taste like beef or chicken or whatever, but that's just a matter of a bit of genetic engineering. We could do something about that. Well, that raises another possibility. Why grow that stuff if it, if it grows that fast? Why grow it in fields? The original reason they were growing it in fields was the idea, well, we can make uh, alternative fuels out of it. Well, we might not need to. There's, there's a lot of energy technologies coming up and we're not gonna talk about all of them today because there's so many of them, but most of you are aware of them. Um, if we were going to grow algae for food, then we can grow it on the rooftops. We can grow it in the walls. We can grow it anywhere we like because it doubles its biomass in under 24 hours. We can build it into the buildings. And then, well, in the next 20 years, we could expect to see the end of agriculture. Agriculture is a set of technologies that have supported our growth as a species for several thousand years, at least. So this is a pretty big deal. Um, there's an awful lot of habitable land that's been set aside for agriculture that could suddenly become extremely cheap. And if we're going to see humans top out at, um, at less than 10 billion, um, we could spread out. If we've got all of that land, we don't really necessarily need cities. You know, I go, wait a second. Cities perform a lot of really useful functions. We need cities. With, um, with the climate change we're looking at, we might not have the cities by 2100, they might all be drowned. So uh, this ability to recycle our agricultural land and make a whole bunch of villages, that's going to be important to us. Um, what could go wrong? Well, uh, we're already seeing lots of very nasty health effects of uh, genetic modifications. And there's obviously quite a lot of debate about whether GMOs are actually not healthy for you or, or not. But there's no question they're not healthier for the bees. There's no question that the, the monocultures that we have evolved uh, are, are vulnerable to a lot of ecological catastrophes. Um, so for example, um, the bananas that we are used to eating are not the bananas that our grandparents ate. The Gros Michel, I think they were called, uh, bananas that they used to eat. Uh, they were all wiped out by a, a single organism. And the bananas we're eating, they're all being wiped out by a single organism. And since we live in a, a, a global culture, uh, a, a, there's an enormous vulnerability in saying that, well, we're going to have just a few organisms that we're going to rely on no matter how fast they grow. Maybe that's a problem. The speed with which these changes are occurring and could occur when various kinds of catastrophes hit. Well, we're already seeing a global catastrophe and we've already seen that it's very difficult for our civilization to adapt to what is basically just a radically new strain of common cold. Coronavirus the, the, is, is pretty much the same thing that we've been dealing with as common colds. It's just that this is a strain that was very genetically different to what we were used to. 
if a tiny little change like that is something our civilization can't adapt to, a lot of these things are going to be a much bigger deal indeed. So um, I'm going to move on. 3D printed everything. Well, we've all seen 3D printers in the local hardware stores or electronics stores. Why are they a big deal? People made a big song and dance about them. Uh, surely there's not all that much to them. Well, uh, this is a picture if, of um, a bunch of 3D printed houses that have been printed out of the mud that was found on site. That's a big deal, particularly if we're going to have to build a bunch of eco-villages in a hurry because all the cities have been drowned by rising oceans. And you might go, well, no, no, no. The oceans are only going to rise by a few inches. Uh, maybe there are some low-lying cities, but uh, that's not going to be a big deal by 2040. Yeah, we're already seeing in Texas that that kind of thinking is not valid, that uh, a lot of the changes that are induced by rising oceans uh, will involve drama that we can't even begin to appreciate. Um, uh, the discovery that uh, there are methane producing processes in permafrost that are beginning to be activated all across the Arctic Circle, I'm not just beginning to, there are methane explosions happening all over Siberia, um, uh, leaving huge craters, we're looking at a catastrophe. The question is only how rapidly can we respond to the change? So 3D printing uh, houses and buildings out of the mud we find on site, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and it can be done incredibly rapidly and incredibly cheaply. Well, that's great. What else can we do? Well, um, this is a 3D printed heart. Uh, the, the collagen scaffold is 3D printed, and then you simply soak it in a bunch of stem cells and you can get a functioning heart out of that. Now, I'm oversimplifying because happily I don't do that kind of engineering, but the point is, this works. We've actually got this working now. Um, and then you're used to 3D printers that can print the plastic parts for a, a drone, but the number of different substances we can print with has been rising exponentially over the last 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, we could 3D print slowly with a few plastics. Now we can 3D print with all kinds of metals. We can 3D print with electronic components that are actually embedded in the printing medium. We can 3D print a whole drone those already exist. I don't know if that's really a picture of one or not. It looks a bit bored underneath. But the point is, we can do that. We can 3D print drones. So we can 3D print all kinds of devices where if you supply power, they will do work, including the printers themselves. And I say we can, yes, there are, there are currently uh, no 3D printers that can print a copy of themselves. But within the next 10 years or so, we will get there. And at that point, we will see an astonishing explosion of what I'm calling co-manufacturism, alluding to uh, the, the old Marxist idea that the means of production would be distributed across the proletariat. Basically, everybody will have complete access to printing anything, anything you want. And the designs for these things are all going open source, open content. So a lot of the things that we assume about the way Amazon works, for example, won't be valid anymore. Instead of ordering away to Amazon to get your gadget or your gizmo, or for that matter, your shoes or your glasses or your coat or uh, your chair or whatever it is you want, um, it'll be routine for us to 3D print most of these things, including 3D printing the printers that will 3D print the houses and so on. So there's a feedback loop of capability that comes with this. And I'm not suggesting that that's going to lead to the end of capitalism and capitalism is an incredibly useful thing, but 
uh, a lot of the things that we presently pay through the nose for uh, involving various kinds of therapies uh, and substances, those will start to be accessible for 3D printing as well. So a lot of the assumptions we have about the way the world works are not going to be valid in the next 20 years. Well, what could go wrong? Um, uh, if you've not seen uh, the video Slaughterbots, go to YouTube and watch it. Uh, there, there are already, uh, these things are real. The US military has them and has demonstrated the ability uh, in various videos to, to, uh, to control them. But this is not a consumer technology yet. The idea with a Slaughterbot is you 3D print a drone and you bake into it some AI that's able to do facial recognition. I think you'll credit the idea that that's not that difficult to do. Um, and then, uh, but you also print into it uh, just a, a little hollow. And in that hollow, uh, you have a, a little electrical trigger mechanism. You can print all of that. And then you can go and using uh, the advice you can find in multiple YouTube videos, you can go and make yourself a shaped charge, which is basically just a little cone with a little bit of gunpowder or commonplace explosives. You can make them out of, out of uh, agricultural fertilizer, pool chemicals, lots of things. Um, and what this um, little shaped charge does is it creates a little spike of metal um, that is forceful enough to enter a skull. And so the idea is the slaughterbots uh, well, we could have open source designs for these things that are shared all over the world, and anyone could decide to um, build thousands of these things and direct them at any group of people. They, in fact, they could set up automated filters to simply say, well, I would like to make my 100,000 or 10,000 or even just 1,000 slaughterbots uh, or even 100 slaughterbots, I'd like them to go and kill people of this particular ethnic persuasion with these particular political views uh, who have turned up in this particular community. Um, this, is, um, this is a kind of blocking that is unfortunately all too feasible. So um, how do we adapt to that as a society? I don't know, but I know that it's easily possible. Uh, the fact is as a programmer, uh, the moment I saw that video, I started thinking, could I program such a thing? And the answer is, yeah, I've been around the traps enough to know how to do that. Oh, I don't like that at all. So we're looking again at the possibility for catastrophes and you might go, well, science fiction, not gonna happen. It's already happened. Um, uh, uh, there was a, a South American dictator who was threatened by drones about two years ago. So um, the idea, becomes a mass market technology, it's real. Okay, uh, Mr. Fusion Home Reactor. That seems a bit unlikely. Uh, right now, we are seeing multiple, over a dozen uh, well-funded companies working on what look to be viable prototypes for small fusion reactors. MIT have one. Um, this is a, uh, uh, a reactor that uh, there's a, a group called Commonwealth Fusion. They're building one. Um, this is a, 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 um, oh, uh, it's a defense contractor. And again, I'm sleepy, so it's not coming to me. That's okay. Um, uh, a lot of these things are being built now because superconducting magnets have become something that are much cheaper and things that can uh, work at sometimes close to room temperatures, but certainly cheap temperatures, liquid nitrogen temperatures. Uh, and so if you can build cheap superconductors, you can start to approach small fusion reactors. And some of these dozen companies are working on technologies. This is uh, the general fusion reactor uh, that don't even require superconductors. Uh, theirs has a whole bunch of pneumatic tubes that compress a metal that induces uh, far greater temperatures and pressures for a, a pellet of fusible material than we've been able to achieve to date. All of these are companies that are expecting to bring their product, at least their prototype to market before around about 2025. 
So um, these, um, these breakthroughs mean that, uh, well, by 2041, maybe we really, really can have a Mr. Fusion home reactor. It might not be quite as small as the one from the movie, but um, something that you could put in a room of your house in the same way that, that right now you can put a Tesla battery in a room of your house. It's not that far beyond what those companies are working with. Most likely, uh, these things won't be safe enough to do that with. So it's more something that maybe your local council or your local state can run. But the point is, this really is electricity too cheap to meet. It. This is uh, free energy, uh, carbon neutral energy. And there's more. Um, there's a, 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 a design for a fusion engine, rocket engine, um, that um, uh, came to light about uh, two months ago. Um, the lady's name is on this. Uh, and again, as I said, I'm sleepy this morning, so uh, you can go and, and look that one up. But um, I'll distribute links after this to the folk who've registered. That's probably the easiest thing to do. That way I don't have to remember. But anyway, um, this is a, a, a fusion engine uh, where the idea is that using any of the fusion reactors that are on the books, um, we can manipulate the magnetic fields that contain the plasma inside the reactor so that we can emit little plasmoids. These things occur naturally with solar flares. These little plasmoids uh, could then be used, even though they don't have a lot of mass, they could be used as very effective rocket engines because they have incredible velocity. Uh, these plasmoids are emitted according to the papers about this engine. Oh, that's the lady's name. Uh, Ebrahimi, that's it. Um, they're emitted uh, with a speed of around about 500 miles per second. So even though they are um, very lightweight things, the amount of momentum that you get out of that is very significant. So that raises the possibility of uh, getting ourselves around the solar system at um, not one gravity like in the expanse, but still um, getting to uh, the asteroids in, in days and weeks rather than months and years, uh, which is to say it creates a possibility of real useful asteroid mining vehicles. And that's a big deal for reasons we're about to look at. So the downside, what could go wrong? There's a, a series of books by Larry Niven called the Known Space Series. Like I said, this stuff was science fiction. It isn't anymore. Uh, in, in Niven's books, um, there's a spacefaring civilization called the Gazinti. They have a fast <laughs> light drive. And um, they are um, very surprised, but they're very warlike, and they attack human colonies on multiple planets at once. The humans don't have fast and light engines. They only have poor old fusion rockets. But the Gazinti discover, to their sorrow, that uh, a reaction drive's efficiency as a weapon is in direct proportion to its efficiency as a drive. I wouldn't like to stand in front of a plasmoid traveling at 500 miles a second. I don't think anyone would want to. So exactly what kinds of weapons come out of these technologies, I don't know. And I don't know what can be done with them. But again, we look at things where um, our ability to respond to change and to share learning becomes the critical factor in the survival of our civilization. So this agile stuff we're talking about is not trivial, it's not optional, it's not something we can expect scrums enough. We have to go a lot further. Augmented reality. Um, I think most of you will have either uh, played with a, uh, an Oculus device or uh, I, I got to play with a HoloLens in 2015. Uh, the, the virtual reality things like Oculus are put in the shade if you actually try an augmented reality device um, that they're astonishing. I, I remember um, uh, what really got me was, um, it was a, a simple demonstration. I, I, I was at a conference, someone had one of these things, I put it on and there was um, a game where uh, basically you, you looked at a surface, the thing's got basically uh, some uh, connect cameras 
pointing outwards at the world so it can see where surfaces are and it can map them. So um, I could see the word start game appeared on any surface I looked at. And so you do, it's the first generation device, you did this. Now they have full finger tracking, you can use buttons and so on, but the first generation you had to do that to click. Anyway, so I did that and I saw this machine break through the conference room wall and, um, and make a basically a tunnel. It looked, it looked like a robot, a tunnel through the wall. And as I'm saying it to you, it's obviously it was just computer graphics, <coughs> but it was really compelling. I mean, you know, you're walking around, you can look at the thing. I walked up to it and I looked through the hole and I could see there was a corridor behind it. Of course, it wasn't a real corridor, but it looked pretty real. And I could see at the end of the corridor, there was sort of a little L-shaped section. There was a door, the door opened and this little floating robot came floating down the corridor toward me. And that was quite compelling. What was even more compelling was it came out into the room and started flying around me and started shooting at me. And of course, if I did that, then I could shoot back at it. It was a, just basically a space invaders game, but a three dimensional space. Now I should say the first generation device, you only had a 60 degree field of view. So if I looked away a little bit then I couldn't see it anymore, but I could still hear it. It was three dimensional audio. And so I played this game running around, it was very aerobic uh, for about 15 minutes and then the game crashed. And it was the best crash I ever saw because while the game crashed, the rendering engine and the device, this is a wireless augmented reality device, it kept working. So now I could walk around and look at these little robots floating in the air and see how they were designed. And I could look down the corridor, I looked sideways and I could see there was a mop and a broom, a virtual mop and a broom that were just in the corner of the corridor. So what really got me though was when I took the device off because the people wanted it back. And um, for the next two hours or so, I found myself questioning the reality of everything I looked at. And even now while I'm telling you this story and I see the microphone on my desk, there is in the back of my mind, this weird notion, I want to reach out and touch it because I'm not certain that it's real. It was that compelling. And that was the first generation device. The second generation device is like 120 degree field of view and uh, full finger tracking. You can hit buttons and whatever, but it was the rewiring of my brain in 15 minutes that was compelling. So once the first consumer versions of these devices come out, it'll change everything far more completely then mobile phones have changed everything in the last, uh, well, since, since the, the picture I showed of uh, uh, the guys in the stand up at the Med in 2000, we didn't have any mobile phones. It was certainly not the kinds that we have today. Uh, iPhone came out in 2007. So that was seven years before iPhone. Uh, the world we lived in was a lot simpler in a lot of ways. So uh, when we start to get these immersive experiences, to be shared that's really the power of them that we are able to get multiple people in multiple places sharing the same media and working on it together and that raises the idea of hollow portation where the people themselves the renderings of them appear as part of these models will no longer be trapped by diseases like covid uh, you'll be able to work with people in a virtual office that'll feel exactly the same as in a real office. They'll look the same. You won't see them wearing funny devices on their head because we'll just CGI those devices out of the rendering. And you'll be able to work with anyone you want around the world, limited only by time zone. And we already have devices, proofs of concept that do this. A little ring of 3D cameras is necessary at the moment, but it won't be because all of this technology is going to be baked into consumer devices, in particular light bulbs. So that raises uh, a more powerful vision of this, because if you can bake the cameras into the light bulbs, into the LEDs you plug in, well, it's not a big step beyond that to put lasers into those light bulbs. Lasers are cheap. And if you can track people's eyes as they walk around the room, you can beam the augmented reality directly into their eyes. I don't have any devices that'll do that today, but the Oculus guys gave a talk last year where they were talking about doing exactly that. So uh, ambient augmented reality, where 
anywhere where you are uh, close to a light bulb or close to someone's phone or close to your own phone, um, that you don't need to wear a pair of goggles. Or maybe it's not a phone, maybe it's in the streetlights. That starts to become a very different world. A world where it's not just that you have to test the reality of the things around you, but we can back the reality of these things up with, say, drones that could provide the touch that goes with what you're seeing. You simply wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Well, a drone makes a noise, but there's a lot of things we can do to manipulate acoustics. So basically all I'm saying is this stuff is going to become more and more immersive and more and more invasive until we start to see things that maybe right now seem nightmarish. Uh, there's a show called Black Mirror where they came up with an idea in a, a really scary episode, uh, White Christmas. If you've not seen that show, just go and watch. It's got, um, uh, oh, I hate the fact that I can't remember names when I'm sleepy. Doesn't matter. Um, it, it's wonderful. Uh, and basically, uh, the technology is just that people who don't want to interact with you turn on a, a blocking mode where suddenly you can't see or hear them. And if you do something that makes you really an outcast in society, you can wind up in a situation where everybody blocks you at once. So that sounds very nightmarish, but it gets worse if you watch. There's another episode of Black Mirror where we're, we're used to this idea of deep fakes now. We, we recognize that it's possible to take someone's appearance and um, make an animated uh, a video of, of their face uh, talking and you can, this is technology is getting to the point where you can't tell the difference. It's not quite there yet. Most of the time anyway, it seems like you can tell, tell the difference, although I wouldn't be surprised to hear that uh, a certain very well-known world leader was almost entirely computer graphics because I can't figure out how that guy could be real. Anyway, um, the point is when you combine that with augmented reality, then you can start to convince people of things that are really unreal. There's an episode of Black Mirror where they convince a bunch of people that another bunch of people are evil zombies and they start going and shooting them. And they're not evil zombies, they're innocent civilians. So uh, then, well, then we have the possibility of entire civilizations or entire cultures that are hypnotized, a mass hypnotized through these technologies. It's not impossible. And in fact, there is a science fiction book called Starship Troopers. Uh, many people read this book and are not aware that there is a, a mass hypnosis theme in it. Uh, but if you go and look for where Robert Heinlein, who's the author of that book, um, uh, talks about um, hypnosis, you'll find that it's there throughout. Um, and actually the book was written because Heinlein was worried that the communists were going to invade uh, the USA after the USA signed various uh, uh, nuclear treaties and, uh, and enslave the whole population. There is a fair case to be made that that's already happening. Not quite in the way that uh, you wouldn't use augmented reality to do, but the omnipresence of um, uh, media feeds that aren't necessarily real we don't need to talk about fake news and all of that stuff from one side or the other. The point is this kind of interference has already happened in the USA and probably in your country too, wherever you are. Okay, uh, enough of those nightmares. Uh, we have some exciting new possibilities uh, when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence and something I'm calling quantum intelligence, which I think is such a natural buzz phrase that everybody will be using it if they're not already. So there's a, uh, an algorithm called GPT-3. It's a neural network based algorithm. The basic idea was what would happen if we built a really powerful neural network and then sampled the entire internet and programmed it to produce text using the entire internet as its, uh, its source. And they produced a device that initially was startling because of its ability to produce convincing narratives in a certain style. 
And then more startling when you could actually interact with it conversationally and tell it what kinds of narratives you wanted to have. And you could say, for example, well, I would like a commentary on uh, British politics done in the style of Jabberwocky, and it'll produce you a poem with, in the style of Jabberwocky with a bunch of simple couplets talking about British politics. It, 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 that, that's real, that works right now. And what's even more startling is that it also works with hypertext and JavaScript. And people have realized you can actually go to GPT-3 and say, all right, I would like to have a uh, website for my uh, um, uh, travel consultancy business. And it should have the usual pages around, you know, a home page and an about page and so on. And done in a style similar to this website, whatever. And the damn thing will generate you all of the working JavaScript and HTML and XML and so on, all of it in a few seconds. So suddenly front-end application programmers are out of a job. We, we will still need to test the results of sites and programs produced with GPT-3. So testers are still in work, but um, a lot of the work we're used to thinking is skilled programming work that we used to, well, we did when we didn't have quite this much gray hair, um, that, that those people are as obsolete as horse and buggy drivers were around about the time that um, uh, the Model T was, was, uh, was just coming out. And, and that's a weird and scary prospect. That sounds like science fiction, but it's not. This is real. And they're providing limited access to people who apply if you just go and say, we can get on their list. And uh, sometime if you tell them why you want access to this thing, they will open it up to you. And there's a lot of people who are using it right now. Uh, obviously there are really dramatic retail plays for that. Well, a lot of people have heard of AlphaGo. Some people have not. Go is um, the most complex board game that humans play. And for a long time, it was uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea in artificial intelligence was that we would never be able to build, or not in a very long time, to build a program smart enough to be human master Go players. Well, uh, about uh, four or five years ago now, uh, Google built a thing called AlphaGo that built that beat the world's top human grandmaster, Lee Sedol, and then they did something even more remarkable, because that that AlphaGo was trained with uh, a copy of all of the games of Go uh, that, that have ever been played. They basically took that and used it as a training base for, um, uh, for the neural networks in AlphaGo. But then they went, hmm, it would be interesting if we tried not giving it any training games and just had it play itself and evolve. Um, so they started a thing called AlphaGo Zero that does not know how to play Go. Um, it, it, it knew the, the rules of the game, but that was it. And it, it took, uh, if I recall correctly, a couple of weeks before it was able to beat the, the AlphaGo program that beat the best human uh, Go master without ever being trained on any human set, human uh, training set. So the point is, this is the most complex board game humans play. A lot of the games we play around trading strategies are much simpler than Go. So uh, these are breakthroughs that can be applied and are being applied to games that are fundamentally important to the way that human civilization works. And a lot of the catastrophes we've seen in the way that markets work, and also a lot of the weird things we've seen in the last year where no matter how terrible uh, life in the Northern Hemisphere has become under COVID, the markets keep going up and up and up and up. This kind of monkey business is possible. So I don't know why it wouldn't be something that was real. And then we have quantum computers. Um, for those who have never heard of the things, uh, quantum computers are things where a, a bit in the computer, conventional computers, a bit is either one or zero. It's either true or false. In a quantum computer, there's a range of probabilities about what the state of the bit is, and you can then do 
algorithmic work by combining these bits before you finally collapse the state of the entire calculation and get the result out. And the point of that is that you can do in linear time what in a classical computer would be a, a non-linear, sometimes an extremely expensive calculation and, and some, a, a calculation that would go exponential, super exponential as the domain became more complex. Well, quantum supremacy is the idea that we can build a computer that demonstrates its ability to, um, to outperform classical com computers at some reasonably complex problem. And last year, Google demonstrated quantum supremacy. They have a machine that's only got 54 quantum bits, but it did in about 200 seconds what uh, the best, the most powerful supercomputer in the world would take 10,000 years to do. So when you combine these breakthroughs, well, what happens? It's not at all unrealistic at this point to expect that by 2041, a HAL 9000 style uh, computer will be commonplace, that this is a technology that we should naturally expect at this point. Uh, it, it's, it's not science fiction. This is real. Uh, it, it's, not, um, it's not even a stretch to expect that. So what could go wrong? Uh, if you've ever seen a movie called Colossus, the Forbin Project, in that movie, uh, intelligent computers get control of all of the world's nuclear stockpile and then start issuing demands that humanity is going to behave in a certain way, that humanity will either behave peacefully or, um, or it will establish a different kind of peace. Uh, uh, well, Happily, humans are becoming more and more peaceful. They don't, that's, not, that's not really our problem now. The rates of murders and wars and violence in general have been dropping dramatically over the course of the last century. We're, we're, we're astonishingly peaceful compared to our parents and vastly more peaceful than our grandparents. Um, but this idea that human behavior can be manipulated uh, to achieve particular kinds of outcomes, we just talked about that. It's possible to do by inducing tropisms into financial markets. And we have no idea what could happen then. So this, again, is something that um, if we can't respond to these sorts of changes, the Fermi paradox has a very clear, simple, obvious explanation. Um, okay, universal basic income is what people usually talk about. This is an idea that goes back to uh, 1920s, even earlier than that. There was a guy named, but since we were in 2021, I thought we'll talk about 1921. There was a guy named C.H. Uh, uh, Douglas who came up with this very simple proposition. Um, of course, you would look at that calculation and say, oh, A plus well, inequality, A plus B, as long as B is not, uh, is greater than zero, would be greater than A. Well, A is supposed to represent all of the incomes of all of the workers in society. And B represents the costs of automation and also the profit that's taken out of the different businesses by the business owners. And so the point is that when you factor in the costs of the factories and the profits, that's a greater sum of money than is paid to the workers. And so therefore, by definition, the workers cannot afford to buy the products that they're making. And they wind up with a business cycle uh, where uh, the, the amount of money in circulation isn't sufficient for what's basically overproduction. And then businesses close. And then the government does various things to issue money to basically try and, and uh, bump up A. And, um, and well, you, you have... Um, all of the nasty effects that happened in the early part of the 20th century, the depressions and the wars and so on, wind up being produced by this one simple inequality. And what Douglas thought should happen instead was, he thought that, um, we're not going there yet. He thought that we should, well, governments should issue uh, an amount of currency equally to everybody in the society that would be uh, commensurate with 
the, the amount of production that had happened in the last little while. And if you track this steadily, you wouldn't get recessions, you wouldn't get inflation, you would have constant amount of value in your money and you wouldn't have to do what governments did instead of that. So what governments did instead of that was they started issuing loans to banks. That's how they create money. And the banks then issue loans to um, their customers that are far in, uh, in excess of the amount of money that's actually on deposit. And this is fractional reserve banking. There's no, this is not secrets, this is not voodoo, it's just the way the system works right now. And the way the system works is that the banks create money out of thin air uh, via loans, and then that money goes into circulation. And the government controls the way that works via fractional reserve, or at least in the US it did do up until the start of last year when uh, the US went to zero reserve finance and now banks in the US are allowed to print as much as they like. And if you think that's not going to have any effect over the next few years, I would suggest you might have some surprises coming. Anyway, point is, there's a lot of people who've got excited about this idea of universal basic income. And there are a lot of people who are beginning to go, gee, you know, that idea and the idea of uh, blockchain and Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrencies, they go together really, really naturally. Obviously, we have seen um, cryptocurrencies become extraordinarily successful in a way that things like electronic gold and so on were not. And there are presently multiple universal basic, universal basic income trials going on all around the world. Um, this is starting to become a very popular and mainstream idea. And there are some countries that are preparing to, to run um, larger trials. And there are some countries that have been running universal basic income schemes in some of their states for a long time. For example, the USA has had a simple version of universal basic income in Alaska as a, a reason for people to move to Alaska for over a generation. It's not enough to um, keep everybody there alive, but it does change the standard of living pretty dramatically and people there are very wedded to it. So um, mainstream ideas uh, for certain segments of our population, for others, very challenging and radical ideas. But point of this is that there is another form of um, uh, universal basic income that we don't talk about, that is real for all of us here. We couldn't even talk without this form of universal basic income, which is to say goods that are delivered to us that we're not paying for. And that's the open source movement that underpins most of the internet. So the technologies that support me talking with you right now, they wouldn't exist if it wasn't for, uh, for this. And the amount of value in those technologies we just talked about in a 3D printing context is going to go astronomical over the next 20 years to the point that if we think about, um, well, A is the amount of salaries that people are being paid, B is the profit for the owners of manufacturing and um, the, um, uh, the cost of, uh, of the land and the factories and so on, keeping the lights on. D could be the, the, the debt that's being created in the banks. Well, it's fair to think that at least for the next 20 years, um, that will be greater than A plus C, where C would be the benefits we're getting from open source, open content. But with 3D printing and maybe with the, uh, actually, I think this is wrong. I should move the, the, um, the D, um, to, if, if D was actual, universal basic income, then it goes on the other side of the equation. We could have A plus C plus D is greater than A plus B. That's my bad math. You get the idea though. Um, when that inequality flips and um, the salary plus the open content benefits plus universal basic income, when that outweighs across the society, that outweighs the um, salaries that have to be paid plus the profits and the plant costs. That's the definition of an age of abundance. When that tipping point is reached, then we're going to see a change in social form 
but we can't possibly understand today. Okay, what could go wrong? Um, two things come to mind. First is all those cryptocurrencies, all the electronic currencies, they're all in computers that are vulnerable to solar flares. There was a, a flare in 1859 called the Carrington event that um, uh, was so violent that um, telegraph operators received electric shocks, sparks flew out of the power supplies of their telegraph gear, and they were extremely startled to find that when they unhooked the power supply, they could still send messages just because of the strength of the magnetic flux that was created by this coronal mass ejection from the sun. That was 1859. These coronal mass ejections hit the earth on a regular basis. There's pretty good odds that within the next 25 years to 50 years, we're going to see something as strong as Carrington and we're not ready for it. Our satellites are not ready for it. Our ground systems are not ready for it. And if we don't get them ready very quickly, then Y2K, even the very worst imagination I ever had about it, would be a walk in the park. So that could go wrong. And that would be the end of any of this idea about cryptocurrency or universal basic income or possibly the internet itself. But the, the, the obvious other thing that can go wrong is there's a lot of people who currently have a vested interest in the inequalities in society. That's part of the reason that we don't have universal basic income today. The Jekyll Island meeting, if you're interested in, in the history of the thing. Well, those people are going to guard their interests. Maybe they will guard them strongly enough that we will never see this universal basic income stuff become a, a reality, even though it's possible. And that'll be a dramatic crimp on human civilization's development over the next 20 or 50 or 100 years. That would be wrong. Now, I'm not going to talk about number eight because I didn't get a chance to do the slides for it. And I'm not going to talk about number nine, even though it's really good fun because I didn't get a chance to do the slides for that either. But I do want to talk about number 10 because after all, this is Agile in Space. And I'd be shortchanging you if I didn't. So things we have seen so far as breakthroughs. Well, there's been a lot of space breakthroughs. And I don't need to tell you about Elon Musk's efforts or for that matter, Jeff Bezos's efforts. Those guys are going all out. Um, and um, there's a cover story that they're going all out because they're, they're just great humanitarians. They want to build a colony on Mars. I don't know whether you believe that or not. I don't, and here's why. Mars is a hellhole. Uh, apart from the temperature extremes, the microgravity that humans can't survive, the toxic dust, hard ionizing radiation because it has no magnetic fields around it to shield it from uh, cosmic rays or uh, emissions from the sun or anything, uh, or for meteorites for that matter. Um, so everybody has to live underground. Uh, you'll never see the sun. And this is, it's just, I mean, you'd have a much easier time building a colony at the top of Mount Everest or the bottom of Marianas Trench or the middle of the Sahara Desert than you would building a colony on Mars. That's just nonsense. It's romantic nonsense. We love the old Basum idea. Uh, if you if if you're old enough to remember the books, we we love the the romance of Mars, but Mars is a stupid place to build a colony. That's not why uh, smart guys like Musk and Bezos, with plenty of of funds, are, are building their ships. What they want, where they're going, is uh, an asteroid named Psyche 16. And there's a picture of Psyche 16 here. This is a rendering, but it is based on some pretty good telescope pictures we got out of the, the Hubble telescope. Um, so it looks something like that. And we'll know more um, by 2026 because there is a probe being launched next year in 2022 that's going there. And the reason it's going there is that Psyche is a unique object in our solar system. Um, unlike all of the other asteroids, uh, this is a uh, an asteroid is about um, 200 miles across and is made entirely of metal. Iron, nickel, gold, palladium, uh, platinum. Uh, we've only been able to assay it remotely. And so we don't know exactly uh, what it's made up of, but we do know how dense it is. And we, we are very well aware 
that this is the most valuable object in our solar system for at least the next century, maybe the next thousand years, depending on how we develop. Um, there are estimates that it's worth multiple quintillion dollars, where that's the, the total gross domestic product of, of Earth is only about a quadrillion at the moment. But never mind that, we're never going to tug this down to Earth and use the metal here. This is the basis for um, a civilization that will, um, that will be able to expand out into the solar system. That we're going to build rotating habitats out of this thing. And you might go, well, yeah, that's far, far, far in the future. Forget it, Pete. That's a long way away. Um, no, it's not. Here's why. Right now, we're used to the idea that getting to space is extremely expensive. It's like $20,000 a pound to get something to space. But we already have the materials we need to build rotating tethers in, um, they're not even, they're basically in low Earth orbit. But the, the, so what they are is a, a, a station with two bits of cord coming out, Kevlar, carbon fiber, that sort of thing, doesn't need to be stronger than the materials we already have because these tethers don't reach the ground. They reach about 20 miles above the ground and at 20 miles above the ground, they're going about Mach 5, which is a speed that we are capable of building uh, jets that match. So basically what happens, the jet matches speed with the bottom of the tether. And because of the weighting of the tethers, the tether then does all of the work of pulling that vehicle up into uh, low Earth orbit, or in fact, with sufficient velocity to reach higher orbits if we want to do it that way. And doing this brings, and there are already pilot projects on the books uh, for the, the next um, uh, decade, uh, doing this, if we do it commercially, brings the cost of um, getting to Earth orbit down to about $100 a pound which is to say something that you and I could afford. Um, now, that's, there are other things that will come up that will make it even cheaper. And we talked about uh, fusion technologies to get the free energy to do this earlier. Lots of economies of scale in all of that. But the point of this is we can build a system of these on the moons that are going around Mars. We can start to really properly mine asteroids within the next 20 years. So Psyche becomes a target that is accessible. And there are a bunch of less valuable asteroids that are actually uh, nearer to Earth that are accessible as well. Uh, the, the idea though is not about, oh, we, we wanna build colonies in, on the moon or Mars or wherever. If you wanted to build a colony that was in a gravity well, the obvious place to build it is Venus, not the surface, which is hellish, but about 50 kilometers above the surface where you have earth normal gravity or close to uh, earth normal pressure, earth normal temperature, and you have an ionosphere that protects you from meteorites and hard radiation. Um, we could build floating cities there, 3D printing them by harvesting the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen that's in the Venusian atmosphere. If you wanted to, you could build floating cities all over Venus, vastly easier place to colonize than Mars but no one's planning to do that because no one really wants to colonize Mars. The whole point of this is to build rotating habitats that we can uh, use it, uh, all over the solar system that'll have, there'll be idyllic places to live. There was a fellow named McKendry who calculated that if you use current materials, carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes to build these things, that you can build stations that have the internal surface area of a continent. And you can build them relatively cheaply using the technologies which we've already talked about. So suffice to say, um, this is a really exciting prospect that it goes well beyond 2041, but a lot of the early steps are things we can expect to happen in this time frame. So, and the reason why you would want a cover story like Mars is where well, you wouldn't want idiots to start making laws about who owns the asteroids. So if you were Elon Musk, you'd be talking about Mars too. What could go wrong? Well, unfortunately, there's enormous potential energy in 
rocks. And if you can, if you have the technologies to perturb their orbits, you have weapons again. And uh, there's a lovely book by Larry Niven where, uh, and Jerry Pornell, uh, where I think it's called uh, Footfall, uh, where um, they say what well, well, they speculate, they do the math, that if you had a cubic mile of anything, even including hot fudge sundae, that's enough to end civilization on this planet. You just have to hit it with it. And it's not that difficult to do once you've got the technologies we just talked about all whizzing around the solar system. So how do we regulate that stuff using our current social forms? We don't, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to do any of these things in a way that will avoid the downside that what could go wrong. So that's why we have the agile Fermi paradox to deal with. Unfortunately, our social systems um, put people in positions of authority within businesses, within societies who are not adequate to the task. And um, whatever you think of these people, you might have enormous respect for some of them. At least one of them seems like he seems to be a good guy. I'd like to go and have a beer with uh, Elon Musk. But I don't know that Elon Musk, given absolute power, would not become as absolutely corrupt as the other figures on this slide. So we need to do something that's going to give us a way to deal with this. And I only have the most paltry tools to suggest. But I can tell you that if we don't, as a movement, get together and start to understand how the organizations, the businesses, the public works, the societies, the governments, how we can introduce agile ideas to them that are actually going to work, the Fermi paradox is not going to be a paradox any longer. It'll just be a truth. And we can't afford that. So um, the first session uh, I, that I gave at, at the festival, um, I, I talked about the Descaling Manifesto. If you're not aware of the Descaling Manifesto, you might want to go and Google that. There are a bunch of uh, values and principles we've derived from permaculture and from the Agile Manifesto that look like they're awfully useful for uh, evolving ways to deal with some of the problems we just looked at. Mu Hin Shu, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, Shu Hari is what we're all familiar with. Shu Hari is this idea evolved about 200 years after the initial blush of Japanese tea. There was a guy named Fuhaku who was employed to, uh, to create Shu Hari. It was a way to impose order on the community of uh, tea schools so that only the dominant tea schools would become successful and the others would all be strangled. And we've seen that happen in the uh, evolution of agility. I don't have to tell you about the certificate mills um, and you can name the frameworks yourself. Uh, but Muhin Shu was the original principle of tea and it's something that was the original principle of agile as well. That picture I showed at the start of those guys standing up in the Mediterranean, we worked Muhin Shu, which is to say, literally no host, no guest, but um, uh, which is to say, no teacher, no student. We were sharing learning on the C2 wiki. Uh, it was an incredibly fertile place. The entire patterns movement congregated there, and um, that was where Agile was born. Yeah, there was a scrum paper before then, but if you actually go and read it, you'll see that most of what evolved as scrum in the scrum uh, handbook, um, guidebook, whatever the damn thing's called, uh, it didn't exist in the original formulation, was actually ripped out of uh, XP without attribution and without the bits that actually made it work. Nowadays, the Scrum guys like to say, well, of course you need the XP practices to make Scrum work. Point is, the original blush of Agile was about people sharing learning openly. And that's what we're doing here at the Agile 20 Reflect Festival. This is recreating a community that existed in a vibrant first-class form for a very long time and then was kind of crushed under the weight of the certificate mills. What we are doing here, the free and open nature of it, we need to continue. This is not something that should be regarded as, oh, at the end of February, we stop and we go home. No, we don't go home. This is not done. This is not over. This is the start of something. And um, there is a good, solid Australian example 
of something like that. In 1973, there was a, a festival held in a place called Nimbin, which at the time was a sleepy dairy town. Um, 10,000 people turned up. It was Australia's Woodstock. The difference is that this was 73. They knew what happened at Woodstock. They learned from it. They planned to have 10 days of love and peace. And at the end of the 10 days, they decided not to go home. They decided to stay. And that was the dawn of uh, intentional villages all around Tweed Shire and Byron Shire. All Australians know about those places because they are uh, very successful tourist destinations, but more to the point, it was the birth of the permaculture movement. So, um, and that's been influential around the world. So what we are doing now, this is the start of something. This is not about to end. And we need to take that moving shoe principle and make it first order. This is the way the agile culture works. That's our challenge. And that leads to the idea of how do we open this stuff up? The whole notion that we have closed source copyrighted frameworks. You can't even quote segments of the Scaled Agile Framework site without giving an attribution. Uh, otherwise you're doing something illegal. All of that greasy pole nonsense has to go away now. We have to take the stuff that we have in common and build on it in a business agile sense, which is to say business agility first, all the stuff we do with uh, IT teams, that's something sometimes we need, sometimes we don't, but uh, agile hamburger joints is something that we have people in Xscale Alliance who are doing exactly that. Uh, Darcel Rogers, his son has a chain of fast food restaurants and they are using business agility to run them, open book management to run them because this leads to dramatically improved capability to adapt to changing market conditions. And you bet they've got changing market conditions in this year of our COVID. So <sighs> I will stop share. Um, I've kept you all far longer than I had any right to. Um, I'll open the floor. So Peter, first question, what time is it? Where you are, because I saw you this morning when I woke up and I had my first call. You're already there. So I am sleepy. It's eight thirty-seven in the morning here, uh, and uh, oh after the session we did last night, um, I really hadn't done any of the slides for this one yet. So I got up about three. So it's uh, it's too early in the morning for me, but uh, I didn't want to skip this one. I think it's too important a topic. I think you created a, a really good content there. You can you can. You have to show this to a lot more people. I, I hope you will help me spread it. So I'm going to put the video up shortly. And I really would love it if you would go to everybody who's involved in the conference and say, hey, look, okay, this one you have to watch. Even though it's a bit woo-woo in places, uh, there's only one group of people on this planet who can actually do something about these, these, um, these problems and these solutions, and that's us. And we have to get together and do this. This has to become a focus for us. Uh, it will find its audience, trust me, like all things. Cool. Well, the, the sooner the better. So the more you guys help, the better. And you also said that you will, would share the presentation with us, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'll even finish off the slides. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, maybe in order to... Um, uh, yeah, and, and I'll add links to them and I'll do all of that. So, uh, but I'll try and get the video out as soon as possible so we can share that and then we'll, we'll uh, add some, uh, some video inserts to it and actually do it properly. But I think we'll, we'll keep it sort of centered on this because I don't know if I could actually say this in quite the same way twice. Um, anyway, any other questions before we, we break? Okay, it looks like people are sleepy and they need to get some rest. I understand that, I need to get some rest. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Oh, go, go for it, Brad. Did I miss the Fermi connection? Was that? Uh, yeah, well, maybe. Um, so the idea is that- um, Or did it come elsewhere? Well, the, the, the answer to the Fermi paradox is that all of the downsides I just discussed, any one of those downsides is enough to end our civilization. So having them all happening at once over the next 20 years uh, is something that 
is very likely to end our civilization unless we can change the form of our civilization to become agile. And that's our challenge. It's not just business agility, it's social agility that we have to achieve. And we have no idea how to do it. So we've got work cut out for us. My apologies, I actually live not that far from Fermilab, which is where my uh, sister and brother-in-law work. So I thought it was referring to more of some of the things in there because the kind of magnets that uh, were in the Mr. Fusion thing are, <laughs> yes. as people wonder as they decommissioned uh -huh. the stuff that was going on on Fermilab, well, you know, once Churn came online, I was like, well, is that just really expensive stuff that's not getting used now, or could it somehow make a uh, a grid for a bunch of Mr. Fusions? Uh, good question. But I should say it is the same Fermi. It was the same Enrico Fermi who um, yeah. was the names of lab that you named after. The names of lab after. You can see how tired I am. Okay. Anything for anyone else? Maybe we will cut it there. Um, thank you all so much for, for staying. Mind stuff, stuff, I gotta say. Go ahead, Brad. It's some pretty mind blowing stuff, I gotta say. It is kind of hard oh, to process it all. And I... <laughs> Uh, in French, we say that was a space trip. There is really this expression. So space trip. I thought it was say de l'algebra. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we said agile in space. Um, I'm in I'm in Morocco. In, uh, I'm in Morocco. In Australia, Brad is in Canada or US. Uh, Craig is in Scotland. Um, I don't know where the others are. I see some Finnish names and American names. Moonwai sitting here at midnight talking about the future of humanity. Yeah. Only Peter Morales can do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Only the agile culture could do it. It's not just social agility, but emotional as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I love the idea that um, anything any of us do, we're all connected in this. And if I happen to have a particular focus, uh, it's only because I've got a little bit more gray hair. Um, so no worries. You should still have hair. <laughs> That's true. Well, you still got hair, mate. Yeah, more yeah, than me. Style 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 than mine. Out me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Let's get some rest, folks, and um, yes. I'll put the video up as soon as I can. I'll go from there. Thank yeah. you, Peter. But do please Peter. consider this a call to arms or a call to whatever it is that Agile has instead of arms. Mohinshu. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.